Welcome to STEAM Powered, where I have conversations with women in STEAM to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Natasha Coots. Natasha is a primatologist and conservation program manager with the Jane Goodall Institute Australia. She is currently researching habitat fragmentation and its impact on endangered chimpanzee populations, and oversees programs with the Jane Goodall Institute that both support communities and contribute to the conservation of chimpanzees. Join us as we talk about how habitats affect chimpanzee communities, developing a chimpanzee superhighway, and how empowering girls can lead to better economic, social, and ecological outcomes. Welcome to Steam Powered, Natasha. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's really wonderful having you on. Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm very excited. Excellent. Okay, well, so we'll get right into it. You started off in biological sciences and, you know, how did you get from there to primatology? Um, my first undergraduate degree is a degree in uh, biological sciences with majors in genetics and zoology. So I got into that with the intention or hope of uh, eventually working with primates. So I ah. wanted to work with animals, always had a science brain, always innately curious about the natural world so passionate passionate about it but also you know why 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 is everything the way it is so really curious to understand processes and why things happen the way they happen but specifically animals were the way that i wanted to go um and primates were the dream um Ooh. and yeah so i i did that and along the way um I got in contact with the Jane Goodall Institute Australia, being one of the few organisations in the country, given Australia doesn't have any primates, um, <laughs> that, was, that was doing sort of primate specific work. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to be offered a volunteer position with them, which sort of gave me a foot in the door. It wasn't doing um, research, but it was involved in conservation. So it sort of gave me an insight into the other side of, you know, um, animals and advocacy yeah. and um, conservation, that sort of thing, which is very complementary to the biological side of things that I was learning um, at university. Um, and then I went on to do the degree in uh, straight up science with um, honours in anatomy and human biology. And my yeah. honours project was on uh, gorillas at the Melbourne Zoo. Um, so Ooh. I was really lucky to find a supervisor in Australia who specialised in primates and specifically great apes because they were always yeah. the dream so yeah so that was that was kind of how I I got there I, I just worked hard um sort of looked for opportunities and um, also got lucky along the way that's very cool so you know primates from the start what interested you in when you're wanting to work with primates from the very beginning short answer they are super cool <laughs> um, <laughs> fair um, I am yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, but also the sort of questions that I'm really, really fascinated by ha have a lot to do with sociality um, and sort of cognition, higher level processes. So, yeah. yeah, I'm really interested in smart social animals. So primates fit the bill. Um, and, you know, they also live in some pretty interesting parts of the world. They have some really interesting... Um, uh, parts of really interesting ecosystems, um, which I'm also really interested in. So always love being outside in nature. So um, working with primates made sense in that I get to be outside in these really cool environments and also um, looking into and uh, researching topics that really fascinate me. That is very, very cool. And yeah, absolutely. Like there's just so much to cover. It's, I mean, you know, you're not just researching you know, the biology, it's, you know, like you said, the sociology, the psychology and the genetics, like there's so many different fields that touch on just this one area that you're looking at. It's so broad. Yes. It's very, very awesome. So, you know, from there, um, what sort of specific area were, or are you looking at to looking into at the moment? So from my honors project, uh, cause I was working with, uh, captive gorillas, um, it sort of incorporated effects of being in captivity, but also um, uh, looking at visual monitoring um, within the group. So um, how much are they attending to each other? Is it indicative of different social dynamics, different relationships between 
the gorillas because gorillas um, are a little bit different than say chimpanzees. They don't yeah. groom each other a lot. They're not super interactive. So it's sometimes hard to get a gauge on who's particularly bonded with whom. So we were doing this project to sort of figure out if maybe they just keep an, if by keeping an eye on each other, is that an indication of being more closely bonded than other ones? Yeah. The kinds of (laughs) behaviours that they have that indicate relationship that aren't as obvious as with the other species. That's cool. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Then moving on to my PhD was very, very different. Um, So (laughs) so the PhD that I'm uh, working on now, that is working with chimpanzees. And that project is having a look at how a specific type of change in habitat, so habitat fragmentation, which we can unpack a little bit, (laughs) maybe... Uh, as we go on, Um, but habitat (laughs) fragmentation and how that can impact their gut microbiome. So um, essentially the whole suite of microorganisms um, that live within their gastrointestinal tracts um, and trying to understand the mechanisms by which that could be happening. Wow. Okay. There is a lot. Yeah, definitely heaps on fact. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, yeah, very interesting as well, because, you know, I guess more recently (laughs) people have been talking about human gut microbiomes and the way mm-hmm. they affect us, the way that it can, you know, lead to other conditions or the way it can help other conditions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's all very, very cool. And mm-hmm. I guess, you know, so tell me about, you know, habitat fragmentation. What's that? Mm-hmm. Um, so habitat fragmentation is a specific type of um, habitat degradation. Um, so it's essentially the breaking apart of once continuous habitats into smaller isolated fragments. So in the past, it was kind of likened to um, like an island, Um, although more recently we kind of steer away from that terminology because there is more and more research to indicate that the surrounding matrix, so the surrounding habitat, even though it's not a forest anymore, it can still influence that habitat, whereas with an island, water, it's it's different. Um, So, yeah, historically we'd call it an island, but we're trying to move (laughs) away from that terminology (laughs) based on newer findings. Yeah, that's very cool. So yeah. is this um, fragmentation, um, I guess, natural or man-made? Like what sort of kind of effect are we getting? Yes. So um, fragmentation can be a natural process through um, a variety of natural processes. So um, often fire, that's a, a pretty obvious one. Obvious one, yeah. Yep, yep. But there are other natural processes that can lead to fragmentation. However, the vast majority of fragmentation that we see today and sort of in recent history is anthropogenically driven. It's, it's as a result of humans driving land use change. Yeah. Okay. So your general deforestation to be able to create land for other purposes and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Changing to agriculture or, um, urbanization. Um, yeah, just, just basically changing once forested areas, um, into, um, a different sort of landscape. Yeah. Okay. So how does a fragmented habitat lead to a change in microbiome? That's what I'm trying to find out. (laughs) So (laughs) so the hypothesis uh, or my hypothesis is based on, um, so a priori we, so like based on existing knowledge, we know that a a fragmenting a habitat can lead to um, decreases in overall habitat quality. Um, so you get um, local species extinctions. Um, so um, various plant species can no longer persist in that area. Um, so you get changes in the, the, the dynamics within a forest, um, the ecological dynamics. You get decreases in abundance and diversity and, and all these different sort of indices that we use to measure the quality of habitat. That then impacts the animals that rely on those um, those habitats. So um, specifically for my research, my hypothesis is that um, habitat fragmentation could potentially impact the gut microbiome of chimpanzees uh, via a change in either their social dynamics and their diet because their habitat quality has been decreased. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. My immediate thought was, you know, to change in the kind of food supply that's exactly. available to so, them as a result, but yeah, the yeah, social so aspect of having that change makes sense too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that comes from what we know about, um, 
largely from the human gut microbiome. So we know that two of the major factors that shape the human gut microbiome are your social interactions. And COVID actually, I think, might help people better understand horizontal transmission of um, <laughs> microorganisms now. So we know that we can, we can share microorganisms, whether it be a virus or a bacteria or you know, any other sort of microorganism. We can transmit them to each other from um, touching shared surfaces. Yep. Uh, from touching each other, those sorts of things. So that's what we refer to as horizontal transmission. Um, so it's the same kind of idea, but just referring to the gut microbiome. So instead of yeah. a virus that causes a pandemic, <laughs> we're just talking yeah. about <laughs> a general sort of biological process, um, something that goes on all the time. Um, so yeah. research from humans shows that that horizontal transmission does largely contribute to your, your gut microbiome. So the people you live with, you tend to have more similar gut microbiomes to them just because you're, you're horizontally yeah. transmitting. Physical contact, shared yeah, diet, exactly. shared everything. Exactly. Yeah, Exactly. And because chimpanzees are so tactile, their grooming is, is such a big part of their society. Um, they're always in, in contact with each other. Yeah. Because the habitat can affect their social dynamics, it may affect uh, the amount that they're spending, the amount of time they're spending together, it might affect the amount of time that they have to spend sort of in leisure or doing things like grooming instead of having to forage more because there's not enough food available, all those sorts of things. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the idea behind the potential change via the, the social dynamics. That's very cool. Uh, yeah. And yes, yeah, so much to research. There's just <laughs> yeah. so many factors involved. <laughs> it's a huge part. It's essentially like three PhDs in one. <laughs> it is. I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah, just it covers so many different areas. It really so, does. So, I guess because you're, I guess, touching on so many different areas in science and you know sociology, like how do you, how do you narrow any of that focus because they're all so interrelated? Interrelated. Stats. <laughs> 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 Statistics help a lot. Um, so, talking about the interrelatedness, there, there are some relatively high level statistic and that statistical analyses that we can use to um, determine if one process is influencing another. But in terms of kind of uh, your question about narrowing it down, um, uh, it's initially compartmentalization. So in the structure of my research, um, I've kind of compartmentalized the way that I've approached each different uh, sort of subheading within my project yeah. and then the last part of it is tying it all together oh, yeah. so I... it's a bit easier <laughs> to tackle kind of individual sort of subtopics or themes yeah um, and then doing all the sort of the metrics and indices and analyses sort of within that um, and then once I get to the end which I'm not quite there yet <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's going to be the uh the the real challenge where I tie it all together but I have been assured that there are ways and means to do it. It's, it's, um, it's going to be a lot of work. Oh yeah, definitely. So you've got, you know, you've said that a lot of stats is involved, but um, how about field work? How much field work is tied into the kind of work that you do, especially when you have to do a lot of the kind of lab stat work too? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so for this project, I was in the field for a bit over two years. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, because I'm working with, Initially, it was just two different chimpanzee communities. And then towards the end, I got, uh, I secured a little bit of extra funding via a grant um, and was able to incorporate a third field site in there as well. Um, cool. Uh, but because I was working with different communities, I had to split my time, um, yeah. which meant that I had to be out in the field for quite an extended period to make sure that I got a sufficient amount of data to answer the questions I wanted to ask, answer. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that's pretty yeah. involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. So just, you know, backtracking a bit because of the habit of fragmentation, um, are there usually multiple communities of the chimpanzees within the fragments or do they tend to get separated as well as a result? It depends on the size of the fragment. Uh, so in the, the fragments that I was working in, there's only one community in each of the two. So, uh, the, initial fragment that I was working in, that's only four square kilometers. So that, that's oh, quite small. small. Yeah. A lot of chimpanzee communities have home ranges up to 40 or 50 square kilometers. So wow. for example, the other community that I was working with, which kind yeah. of acted as my control group, 
um, in the continuous forest, um, they, their, their home range is uh, conservatively estimated to be at least 40 square kilometres. Wow, that's such a big difference. Yeah, yeah, and chimps are highly territorial. So it's just basically not possible to have more than one community of chimps yeah. in that little four square kilometres. They would literally kill each other. They kill each other, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the second fragment, which I added on um, towards the end of my study, um, they're, again, just one community, but that fragment's a, a bit larger. That fragment's about 10 square kilometres. Um, but again, wow. still not really big enough to support two two individual communities. Yeah, that's crazy. So with the, I guess, my next question was going to be about, you know, the differences between fragments which have more than one community, but obviously you don't have that data for it. But yeah, what yeah. would you have expected out of, not what, what would you hypothesize would be the difference between, say, a habitat with, say, two communities inside mm -hmm. compared to the one? Um, in terms of, in the context of the gut microbiome, um, yeah. I guess you would expect that there would be some transfer going on um, because chimpanzees, uh, females disperse upon um, reaching sexual maturity where they can. Um, yeah. So in some situations where they are in a little fragment, so in the four square kilometer fragment, for example, it doesn't look like there's been much um, immigration or immigration yeah. in that community, which is um, has its whole a whole other <laughs> side of problems there. Yeah, in terms of like genetic diversity and long term. Viability yeah, I was also about to say about how long yeah. a community could survive trapped in yeah. four square kilometers having to exactly. interbreed. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that's just a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the gut microbiome, I mean, you'd expect that if it's a relatively small fragment, it would be relatively homogenous in terms of um, the sort of resources that are available. And I would expect that the, the communities would probably be relatively cohesive um, if they're very limited in terms of um, the size of their home range because there's another community there and because they are so territorial, they probably would avoid each other um, where possible. <laughs> but they probably are interacting with each other a lot more just by way of the fact that there's not a whole lot of space to break up and sort of do the fish infusion that chimpanzees yeah. are. Um, uh, it's very characteristic of um, their social dynamics. So I would hypothesize that the diversity of the gut microbiome would be fairly low. Um, both within and between the communities. I think they'd be quite okay. similar. Yeah. Interesting. Do they tend to interact? Like do the multiple communities tend to interact other than when the females disperse? No, I, generally oh. only aggressively. Wow. Okay. So very territorial. Yeah. Very territorial. <laughs> yeah. It's typically yep. the males that will engage in um, uh, sort of defense of the territory. So males will um, do patrols. So they'll, they'll yeah. go around the perimeter of their, uh, their home range. They will try and expand their home range where they can, but then <laughs> given the others are also territorial, that's where they start coming head to head. And uh, that's very yes, cool. Some that's... pretty aggressive interactions occur. Wow. Okay. That's very interesting. So a lot of your, uh, I guess your field work was actually done in Rwanda. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, entirely in Rwanda. So... Entirely Rwanda. Yes, yes. Yeah. So all of uh, all of my PhD fieldwork is based in Rwanda. So by adding that third field site, uh, it means I was essentially working with chimpanzees that uh, all the different locations within Rwanda where chimpanzees still remain. Wow. Is there a specific reason why Rwanda, or was it just because you had access to the habitats that you wanted to research? So the uh, the supervisor that I'm working with for uh, with my PhD, he was also my honours supervisor and uh, he historically worked with um, the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. he, he has a history working in the country and while he was there uh, noticed that there were these chimpanzees that no one was really doing any <laughs> work on um, and ecologically they're really interesting. They live at relatively high elevations. Um, Fun fact, the, the chimps that I worked with, it's actually the highest known elevation for chimps across their entire range in Africa. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so ecologically, we have a lot to learn from them about how these chimps can adapt to living at such a um, 
a high elevation compared to yeah. other chimpanzees. Um, yeah, so so for that reason, he was really interested in getting um, some more sort of longer term research set up there. I approached him about potentially doing a PhD and he said, would you like to work in Rwanda? And I said, of course, <laughs> um, <laughs> and came to him with my idea for a project. And he said it would be perfect because of the nature um, in which these chimpanzees yeah. still occur in Rwanda. Um, essentially, they're only occur in two small fragments and then in the continuous forest in Nyungwe National Park. Wow. So it was just, it all just worked out very, very well. Yeah. So oh, the planet's awesome. kind of aligned with that one. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Perfect yeah. when it does that. <laughs> Excellent. So how did any of that work relate to what you're doing with the Jane Goodall Institute or are they separate projects that you're running? They are separate, but very much complementary to each other. So my work with the Jane Goodall Institute um, is managing the Africa programs. Um, so uh, the Jane Goodall Institute Australia, we are Historically, we've been a fairly small chapter, although we've gone through a, a relatively large period of growth in the last few years. So I'd say we're now sort of sitting, we'd be a mid-sized chapter um, compared to our, uh, our global colleagues, um, yep. as we are uh, an international organization. And uh, yeah, um, so we, we don't have a large portfolio of work that we support in Africa, um, but currently we are supporting uh, projects in Uganda, Tanzania, Republic of Congo, and we have previously supported work in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so my role as Africa Programs Manager is to manage and oversee and be the liaison um, with our offices in the countries that um, are operating the, the projects that we're, we're supporting. So we sort of do fundraising and things in Australia to support the work over there. So what sort of work so what sort of programs does the Jane Goodall Institute in Australia run over there? Yeah, so um, the projects that we support, at the crux of it, it's all about chimpanzee con uh, conservation. <laughs> um, everyone knows that Jane Goodall is um, OG chimpanzee lady. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Definitely. everything we do is, is chimpanzee-centric. Uh, over the years, a lot of our work has transitioned from working specifically with chimpanzees and sort of doing ecological or biological work to working more with communities because we know that you can't achieve your ecological objectives without factoring in the human communities that are contributing to the issues and that's not to villainize the communities um, it's just to recognize their part in the process and and you need their involvement and their engagement yeah, and yeah. exactly and acknowledge that in order to to achieve the ecological outcomes, we need to work with these communities and, and help them. In Tanzania, we uh, support the, the ongoing research of chimpanzees in Gombe National Park. So that is uh, the site where Jane Goodall first started studying chimpanzees. Um, so it celebrated its 60th anniversary last year, which is really cool. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. So it makes it one of the longest running uh, ongoing field research sites in the world. Um, pretty confident wow. it's the longest one for chimpanzees specifically, maybe even primates, but definitely one of the longest in general um, in the world. So that's that's really great. Uh, so yeah, so we support the ongoing um, research and operation of Gombe Stream Research Center. Um, so that's supporting Jane's legacy, essentially. Um, yeah. The project that we support in the Republic of Congo is a, a chimpanzee rehabilitation center. Um, so it's, uh, it's called Chimpunga Rehabilitation Center. Um, so that's where, uh, chimpanzees that have been taken into captivity or orf like young orphan chimpanzees that, um, have lost their parents due to, um, illegal bushmeat trade, poaching, that sort of thing. They get rescued and taken to uh, a happier, healthier, healthier life in, um, the rehabilitation center. Very cool. Yep. And then Uganda, um, that one is a very community-centered conservation approach. So that one, we support the education of girls and women to help achieve um, greater ecological um, outcomes. That's cool. So, okay, I do want to delve more into that. How does the education of girls lead to those ecological outcomes? It seems like there's a lot of steps involved here. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, there are a lot of steps along the way, but the crux of the theory of change is that 
educating girls. Um, so by supporting girls and helping them stay in school, you are increasing their capacity to have greater earnings later in life. Um, they, there is so much data to support um, the fact that when girls stay in school, they marry later, which delays um, childbearing, which gives them agency to make decisions about their future. Yeah. Whereas you know, marrying as, as kids, essentially, they, they just don't have that agency anymore. It becomes um, a necessity then, as opposed to a, you know, an informed choice. Exactly, exactly. Um, often it's forced um, by, by parents or family, cultural, a, few, a lot of factors um, uh, are involved in it, yeah. But essentially, yeah, uh, educate, keeping girls in school and um, allowing them to complete their education cycle um, means that they earn more, they have healthier families, their children are healthier, they contribute more to the economy of their country, um, which then increases the capacity for the country to improve their social welfare services, all that sort of thing, infrastructure. Uh, they become less reliant on natural resources, which then helps to protect these habitats. Um, they're not having to forage or they're not having to collect wood for um, energy, which like, a lot of people in rural communities do still, like they don't have electricity. They, they rely on collecting wood from the forest to um, light fires to cook even, um, or for light yeah. to, you know, go about their business uh, at nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. So ah. that, that's essentially the theory of change there. Lots of moving parts. So how does the program kind of get these cogs turning in all these different areas? So we, uh, through a lot of community consultation, through some research, through trial and error, uh, and through existing data that's available, um, realized that girls starting their menstrual, menstrual cycle um, were having higher rates of absenteeism, which then led to uh, higher dropout rates. Um, so it was really an impediment to girls being able to complete their education. Education, yeah. yeah. So we decided to try and tackle that, that particular aspect of the issue. So we historically were um, providing girls with uh, pre-made uh, sanitary kits. So they had um, yep. some reusable pads in there. They had um, a couple of pairs of underwear. They had some uh, soap and um, a little mobile kind of laundry hanger with the little pegs on them. And we would give those, we would distribute those to girls mm -hmm. um, as a way to help them to reduce absenteeism, which would help them stay in school, they wouldn't fall behind and help them complete their education cycle. Um, and evidence suggests that that has been relatively effective in the communities that we've been working with. But we also recognize that capacity building is really important. So mm. um, capacity building um, means that people are given the skills to uh, go on and increase their economic capacity essentially so rather than providing girls with pre-made um, menstrual pads we decided that we would transition to a model where we are then training them to make their own recycle uh, their own reusable menstrual pads cool. so they're getting um, sewing skills they're learning uh, they can sell them so they're learning sort of small business enterprise skills because they can sell them at their local markets when they make additional ones um, yeah. They can sell them within their little school markets. Um, they can then teach their peers how to make them. They can teach their parents how to make them. So, yeah, so it's sort of in addition to achieving the initial outcome uh, or the initial objective of reducing absenteeism and helping them stay in school, it also gives them these extra skills which can help them later on in life as well. Yeah, and, you know, it's not just restricted to that. They can expand those skills to other areas and to other, you know, making other things, other kind of uh, small cottage industry enterprises that they could incorporate depending on what they happen to like and know how to do. Exactly. Exactly. That's yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So, so yeah, really incorporating that capacity building aspect to the work. Um, yeah. And we've started doing that over the last 12 months. So it's so far so good. It's, it's, yeah, it's working well. How do you approach the communities to um, get them involved and engaged with these projects? Um, so that most of that work is done through our office in Uganda. So the Jane Goodall Institute in Uganda, they do most of the groundwork. Um, but essentially, 
they, they've been operating in the country for quite a long time. So they're aware of the social, ecological and political landscape. So they have identified areas where um, there are relatively large numbers of chimpanzees living outside of protected areas uh, and areas where there have historically been um, relatively high rates of human wildlife conflict. So they have been the target areas for us to implement these kind of uh, projects. Oh, so you can cool. see where it all ties back into yeah. kind of the chimpanzee habitat con conservation uh, model that we're going for. Yeah, That's very cool. So how, I guess, how is it received by the greater community when, you know, a lot of these things are going to involve a lot of big changes in the way that they approach their livelihoods and, you know, even their social dynamics? Uh, it's it's been received well. So in addition to the work that we do with the girls, so um, with the sort of um, menstrual hygiene work that we do, we also do a lot of community consultation. So um, we engage with the, or by we, I mean the organisation as organization. a whole. Organisation, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the Jane Girl Institute Uganda um, regularly holds um, uh, community meetings and um, engages the community in surveys and gets their feedback and they, they tell us what they need and what they want from us and then we do what we can to support that. That's awesome. Yeah, That's so they're very, very, cool. very much involved in the process. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in, in terms of sort of evaluating the effectiveness, um, uh, the most recent evaluation we did at one of these community meetings, um, we saw a I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but I think it was about a 15 to 20% increase in fathers supporting their daughters to stay in school. Um, wow. So cult culturally, they would prioritise their boys. Yes. Yeah. So girls would, um, you know, if there are fees involved or if there's work to be done around the house, it would be the boys that get to go to school and the girls would miss out and they'd have to take up the additional domestic duties. Yeah. Whereas through our work, Fathers are now recognising the importance of keeping their girls in school and um, we're seeing, uh, yeah, we saw, I think it was a 15 to 20% increase in the attitudes of fathers um, uh, uh, regarding keeping their girls in school and, and understanding the importance of keeping their girls in school. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's brilliant because that was one of the things that I did wonder because, you know, you have that standard social dynamic and you'd have to, I guess in any community where there's going to be a certain way that people have done things and certain way that they want to continue to do things, you have to kind of negotiate and kind of give them ideas of, well, I guess, visible benefits of making those changes mm -hmm. and, you know, the risk reward thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's very cool. When are you off back Nate, to Rwanda? We, well, we all know our, uh, our passports are essentially cancelled at this point. <laughs> We're not allowed to leave the country. Um, yeah. Did you get back in before all the closures or was that a... Just, just. Uh, oh, serendipitously, just... my, my field work wrapped up just uh, before all the COVID craziness hit. So I got oh, back goodness. to Australia like February, mid-Feb. Ooh, just short, year. yeah. Yeah, and so within a few weeks, it all just, Everything like, by the time, like, I just sort of started to feel a bit normal again after living in <laughs> East Africa for two years and sort of, like, being back in, in, you know, a Western city and trying to readjust to that and things would just kind of feel normal and then, boom, COVID yeah. happened. It was just this whole other level of craziness. Oh, that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's just stat work now, I guess, while you're stuck yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah, so just finishing up the, um, the PhD and then also in – the midst of trying to get a project off the ground through work actually, but I'll be sort of PI leading the research, um, looking at designing a corridor between the chimpanzees in Gombe National Park um, through to the border uh, with Burundi. Um, so essentially, yeah, so kind of incorporates um, what I do with chimps and fragments. Yeah. So even though the, the Gombe chimps aren't considered a fragment, they're essentially isolated. Um, there are three communities in that landscape. So again, long-term viability, not great. Um, so we're looking at uh, developing this corridor to connect them with uh, chimpanzee communities 
mainly in Burundi. So in that 14 kilometer span, um, there are some remnant forests and there, are, there is evidence of some chimpanzees still persisting in there. To the full extent, we're not sure. So yeah, in addition to sort of linking up the, the where we know there are larger communities, there are still some chimps in there as well. So sort of linking them wow. all up together. And, you know, that's cool. Yeah. Also, you know, um, uh, reviving habitats and, you know, yeah, all yeah. those sorts of things as well. Nice. Uh, how do you create a corridor? <laughs> uh, so there's, that's, that's what we are in the process of doing. So there's a lot of modeling. Um, yeah. There's a lot of design work that's involved in that. So lots of GIS, lots of, lots of sort of spatial analysis. Um, so uh, there's also the ecological side of things that feeds into it. So what, what do chimpanzees need to survive? So obviously they've got a baseline because there are still some in there, but what is optimally, what, what needs to be in there? What, what plants do we need to be, be growing in that area yeah. to support a thriving um, chimpanzee population? Uh, but then you've also got the social aspect as well because all of the habitat um, degradation and uh, deforestation that's occurred there is driven by humans. Yeah. So a lot of it is privately owned land or community land. It's almost, it's working with those communities and trying to demonstrate the benefit of creating a corridor, so reforesting that land um, yeah. to them. Um, so, you know, the ecosystem services is a huge one. Um, we know that, you know, it's, it's going to help with um, carbon sequestration. Um, it's going to help with um, water quality, erosion, um, nutrient cycling, all that sort of thing. So these are all direct benefits that they can derive from the establishment of a corridor there. Yeah. There's also potential for tour ecotourism. Um, if we can get some thriving chimpanzee yes. communities in that area. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the, the potential also economic benefits. So like the RED program where you get uh, credits for carbon, um, it's, it's possible that they could potentially get in, get some income from that as well. Um, yeah, there, there are just a lot of um, potential benefits for the community. It's just communicating those benefits to them and educating them. A lot of them, they're in marginalized areas. They don't, they don't have access to schools. They don't have access to healthcare. They just, they, they don't understand the value of that land and, and the value to have it, the value to restoring it to um, a natural habitat as opposed to having it as sort of degraded um, farmland or whatever. And some of yeah, it's not even amazing. used as farmland anymore. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's the project that we're currently working on now, which will hopefully be the transition, a direct transition if, if we can align everything correctly and get the funding and everything for it. So from the PhD straight into that one. That's amazing. That's such a cool project. Yeah. 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 So that ties into the, the Gombe work that, um, yeah. we support. so it's sort of an extension of supporting the work in Gombe, um, through the Jane Goodall Institute. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It'll chimp super highway. It's cool. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> love it i should pitch i should put that in the proposal <laughs> the fun just... definitely yep. it's like you can yep. immediately yep. see it's like yep this is the transit way just for the chimps it's great <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but then potentially all these other species as well like we're hoping it will become a thriving ecosystem because chimpanzees yeah. they're forest architects they're essentially their niche within um an ecosystem is a seed disperser um and yeah. particularly for these large seeded tree species chimps are the primary disperser of those seeds so they are essentially helping in the the regeneration of these forests yeah. um, and through that we can use the chimps as umbrella species to then increase the ecological quality uh, of these habitats so benefit to you know other monkeys and other mammals and invertebrates and all the other things that are part of that ecosystem. That's very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So many parts again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. I guess. Yeah. We can move on to some of those extra questions that I had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to your field of work? Well, 
probably surfing, I would say. And I'm by Ooh, no means not- very good, <laughs> but I do you enjoy it. You have to be it. good at something to want to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, I'd say I'm still like beginner, novice. Um, but yeah, yeah it's, it's something that I do get. It, it gives me a lot of joy. That's awesome. So what got you to surfing? Um, always been a beach baby. Um, always, always lived by the coast. Um, even though my work and my general interest is, um, not like very terrestrial. Close to surf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like forests and terrestrial animals and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, the, the ocean has always been very, very close to my heart. It's always, it's been a big part of my life for a long time. I've always lived very close to the ocean and had a really great appreciation for it. Um, yeah. And there's just something about surfing that there's just something about that one out of a hundred times where you manage to catch a wave, that feeling <laughs> that you get when you're on it. It's just, there's nothing like it. It's incredible. Oh, that's amazing. Very meditative. <laughs> yes. It, yeah, it is. It is. Oh, it's very cool. Been doing that much, I guess. Oh well, yeah, I'm coming to the end of summer. So you would have had a few opportunities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been out as much as I can. Awesome. And which childhood book holds the strongest memory for you? It's a little bit of an obscure one, um, but it's called the, it's a picture book. So it's from when I was quite young, but it's the um, Imaginary Menagerie. So it's, yeah, um, it was a, a little, a child who, when they go to bed at night, they imagine that their house is full of all these crazy, wonderful, some real, some mythical creatures. And I think it just really, my, I, I read it every other night and I think it just wow. really highlights that even from a, a young age, I was all about the animals. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> That's very awesome. Okay. And finally, what advice would you give someone who would like to do what you do? Well, who would like to do what you do and what advice should they ignore? If you want to do it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> even if the world is telling you that you can't for whatever reason, because you're a, a girl, because um, you come from a certain socioeconomic background because you've had cir- certain circumstances happen to you in life because you've only achieved such and such academically. doesn't matter. If you want to do it, if you are that passionate about something, there are ways and means you can make it happen. Um, and I'm, I'm living proof of that. I did not have a, a background that was conducive to doing any of what I do but yet I'm still here and I'm still doing it. I'm, and I'm literally living my dreams. So just ignore the naysayers and persist. May take that's you a few amazing. goes, but yeah, just, just keep going at it. If that's your dream, you can do it. That's cool. So what about your background did you feel didn't make you kind of qualify for that kind of, I guess, research and area that you wanted to pursue? Less than ideal childhood circumstances drug and alcohol abuse, domestic abuse, um, financial issues, lots and lots of things that are not uh, conducive to a happy and healthy childhood, um, which then resulted in me not doing particularly well um, in high school. I didn't even finish high school, to be honest. Um, I went off and went into the workforce, um, did some TAFE courses, sort of just, just, you know, completely left any sort of... um, research or academic kind of pursuits and then it, it got to I got to be in my early 20s and sort of took a step back and, and re reevaluated my life and thought well this isn't this isn't the life that I envisioned for myself this isn't my passion this isn't what I want to do um, took a bit of time to really have a think about what I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it and how what I needed to do to get there um, and then yeah. just started taking the steps to um, to do it so I enrolled in uni as a, a a mature age or adult student even though I was sort of early mid 20s so not that old but still older than no you know, it still counts as mature school. age yeah. <laughs> exactly exactly without having finished high school um, so yeah. I had to do the stat test and and do all these other sort of um uh admission requirements that are different than if you're just going straight out of high school so yeah I had to jump through a few hoops but it was something I really wanted to do so I just I persisted and I made it happen. Um, so, so my route into academia is definitely the path less traveled, <laughs> yeah. but it is a path that is a viable option. Yes, yeah. definitely. Not as easy, not as easy as it could be, but I still, I still got here. So. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Like it, it's brilliant that you just yeah you set your mind to it. <laughs> you put in all the hard work to make it happen, and mm-hmm. yeah, you're you're doing what you've wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it took me longer to get here than maybe it otherwise could have if circumstances had kind of been favourable. Um, but still here doesn't. I guess it, it's the journey, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's yeah, the whole point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so many people have these sorts of journeys and it's amazing. And I understand completely that when you've lived through it, trying to come through and understand your position. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, it's it's so really much, important. Yeah, there's so much stigma attached to it. And I think the world almost imparts that shame onto us and makes us think that it's our fault for the, the circumstances that we're kind of born into and, and things that are completely out of our control. But then you get to a certain age and you realise, that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, this, this is just, this is the, the hand I was dealt. Um, and, and it's what I, you do with it. Yeah. And I have the capacity to choose what I want to do with my life. And I'm not going to let that past dictate the future. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, that, that's the perfect lesson advice for everybody because everyone's coming from this different position and, you know, it's, they're going to be a lot of common stories, a lot of unique kind of turns that all these people have and everyone will experience but it doesn't dictate where we're going to go and what we're going to be exactly exactly we're fed this narrative that it's this straight line trajectory um and that if you deviate from the set path then that's it you're done like your life is over but it's really not the case at all a lot of the times those deviations Fill your life with all these different experiences that add so much value to the things that you end up doing eventually. Yes. And it adds more diversity to whatever it is you're applying yourself to because exactly. You know, if everyone came from the same background, you'd all have the same group think. And you know, that that's where the problems are, right? That this is why we're in the positions that we are today. This is why all the issues that are coming out now are the way they are, because everyone's coming from this homogenized way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, science is driven by diversity. Science is, is advanced through novel ideas and innovation. And the only way you get that is through diverse perspectives, diverse lived experiences. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, yeah, before we, we take that for granted, I think a lot. We really do. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that was just a bunch of really amazing advice and you know, thank you for sharing that part of your journey with me because, yeah, as as we said, it's so important for people to understand that people come from all sorts of journeys, all sorts of backgrounds, and with so many experiences that can contribute and enrich, you know, everyone's collective experiences. Exactly. Exactly. We learn through story. That's that's how humans operate. And yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to share my story. And if it, it helps other people, then that's even better. Yes. Well, I'm pretty sure it will. And, you know, this is why I want to share it with everybody. It's great. So thank you so much, Natasha, for joining me today. It has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Learned so much about so many different things. It's been fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Really enjoyed having a chat. Yeah. And if people would like to find out more about you and your work, uh, how can they find out? I'm not super active on the socials, uh, to be honest. Um, But if they... (laughs) If they want to learn a little bit about a little bit more about my work um, with the Jane Goodall Institute, um, my bio is on the webpage, so janegoodall.org.au, um, uh, or you can find uh, my research profile with the University of Western Australia. Um, so just type in my name and um, maybe even Natasha Coots chimpanzee, and you'll probably find me. <laughs> Excellent. I'll include the links in the show notes anyway. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Well, yeah. Thank you again. This has been absolutely wonderful. And yeah, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Great. You too. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. There's a lot to unpack with the scope and impact of the work being done, not just in Natasha's research, but the projects being run by the Jane Goodall Institute Australia. Such cross disciplinary work touches on so many areas, from the health of chimpanzees to human economics and infrastructure. But as Natasha described with the Girls Empowerment Project, Although there are so many moving parts, one contribution can make a difference to the whole. To learn more about Natasha and what we discussed on this show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steam Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also find out more about Natasha's work at the Jane Goodall Institute Australia and her university profile page, the links for which will be in the show notes. 
If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, and share this with your geeky and geek curious friends. You can also support Steam Powered on Patreon and Ko-fi under Steam Powered Show, the links for which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for watching.